My name is Lan Zung. I am a professor in the Cinema Media Studies Department at USC and a proud Vietnamese American refugee feminist. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over the world. Thank you, Lan. Thank you for coming on. Today, we're going to do something very different. We're going to open this up very differently. Um, I wish I could take credit for this idea, but um, you brought it to me, and I think this is amazing. It's a it's a great idea, uh, put together by Vogue. And um, there's 73 rapid-fire questions that we're going to go through before we start our interview. So thank you for having this idea, and I think it's a wonderful get started. So uh, without further ado, here we go. What's your favorite movie? Let's do it. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Favorite movie in the past five years? Not favorite movie, but favorite TV show, which was I May Destroy You. Favorite Marvel film? I hate Marvel films. A book you plan on reading? A shout out to Viet Thanh Nguyen. Um, and the last book of his uh, trilogy, and it will be called The Unfinished. A movie that you read in school that positively shaped you now? A Roman Holiday with Audrey Hepburn. Mm. Favorite TV that's currently on? Reservation Dogs. On a scale of 1 to 10, how excited are you about life right now? Um, six. Samsung or Apple? Apple. Twitter or Instagram? Neither. <laughs> Who should everyone be following right now? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not, um, I'm not following anyone. <laughs> What's your favorite food? Um, absolutely. Bung bao hui. Mm, me too. We got to talk about that. Least favorite food? I love every kinds of food. What do you love on your pizza? Pineapples. Favorite drink? Vodka martini. Favorite dessert? I don't like desserts. Chocolate bars or ice cream? When I have um, desserts, I'll eat ice cream. Coffee or tea? Coffee. What's the hardest part about being a student? Nothing, because I'm not a student. <laughs> What's your favorite band? Um, always and forever, Modern Talking. Mm. Favorite solo artist? <laughs> Prince. Favorite song? Purple Rain. If you could sing a duet with anyone, who would it be? Dolly Parton. Master one instrument, what would it be? Piano. If you had a tattoo, where would it be? Um, arm, upper arm. To be or not to be? That is the question, to be. Dogs or cats? Neither. Bird watching or whale watching? Whales. Best gift you've ever gotten? Um, this is in the plural, but my kids. Mm. Best gift you've ever given? My love. Last gift you have gave a friend? A book. What's your favorite game? It used to be Monopoly. Mm. What's your favorite place to visit? Paris. Where's the last place you visit? Mexico City. What country do you wish to visit? Morocco. What's your favorite color? Blue. And least favorite color? Brown. Shoes or shirts? Shoes. Beach party, romantic dinner. 
Romantic dinner. Jogging or aerobic exercise? Aerobic exercise. Road trip or cruise? Road trip. Best way to release tension? Kickboxing. If you had one superpower, what would it be? Unleash peace on the world. If you had, what's one weirdest word in the English language? Lackadaisical. What's your flower? Orchid. When my name. <laughs> when was the ta- last time you cried? Four weeks ago. Do you like your handwriting? Nah. Do you cook? Um, sometimes, but I hate it. What is your least favorite thing about yourself? My smoking habit. What is your most favorite thing about yourself? My um, compassion. Who do you miss most? My sister. What are you listening to right now? OMD. And favorite girl? Lavender. Who is the last person you talked to on the phone? You, Ken. Who is the last person you sent a text to? (laughs) My friends from San Jose. A sport you wish you could play? Soccer. Hairstyle? Short. Sunglasses? Yes. Scary film or happy ending? Always scary films. Favorite season? Spring. Three people alive or dead that you would like to have dinner with? Thich Nhat Hanh. My My sister, sister. Martin Luther King. Hugs or kisses? Hugs. Lady Gaga or Katy Perry? Lady Gaga, for sure. Where were you born? Saigon. What is the farthest you've ever been away from home? Vietnam. Sweet cakes or savory buns? Savory buns. Lipstick or lip gloss? <laughs> <laughs> Lipstick. What book have you read again and again and again? I don't repeat mm. um, reading books, so nothing, none. Favorite bedtime story? I don't have one. What would be the title of your autobiography? Nothing Follows. Favorite sound? A stream. Favorite animal? Giraffes. What is your crush? Who is your crush? Uh, I think it might be Viet Thanh Nguyen. (laughs) Oh, such a beautiful answer. Oh my God, what a beautiful answer. Last photograph you took. Um, It was for my 50th birthday. You know that 72, number 72, who is your crush? That's number 72 and then 73 was the last photograph you took. You know, um, I I don't want to talk about Viet Thanh Nguyen, but you know... (laughs) Because this is not what this is about. Because I've actually, I think I've known you than him. I think, perhaps, I'm not sure. I think so. mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so. Um, so yeah, but you mentioned him twice, and I think that's so romantic that you know you brought him up twice, and um, it's awesome. It's a, it's, it's just a beautiful thing <laughs> to be married that long and and still have these feelings. Yeah, it's interesting, but um, it's all true. And, you know, I'm his biggest fan. Yeah. So I feel like those questions that we just, it's like the most random uh, set of questions. Uh, You know, I would never think to ask any of these questions. (laughs) Every uh, question that I ever prepare for these show, uh, for these uh, episodes are uh, completely bespoke. They're all custom. I don't go through, you know, 
the only question that I do uh, come up with is that very first question is what does it mean to be Vietnamese? And, you know, thanks to Bao Nguyen, he uh, formulated that and he said, you should ask that. That would tie in, you know, the, the thematic, um, it would, it would really bring everybody together. And, um, so right. with that in mind, what does it mean to be Vietnamese to you? Well, so first off, I wanted to say thank you, Ken, for inviting me on your podcast. I think it's great to have um, these kinds of conversations with the Vietnamese diaspora. Um, and so grateful to be here. And I'm grateful for that fun exercise of asking me random questions and me being as honest uh, with you from the get-go. Um, so my response to what does it mean to be Vietnamese um, is such a good question because I thought I had uh, an answer to that, but it does change um, and it does depend on, um, um, what is it? On my, the context um, where I find myself in. For, so for, what it, for example, um, when I was growing up, and one of your questions is to ask about my childhood. So I'll just try to answer that um, at the same time. But so I grew up in San Jose, California, my hometown. Love my childhood, even though it was um, hard, uh, especially hard for, for, for because I was both a girl and a refugee. Um, and it was a really working class neighborhood um, at the time, this was pre-Silicon Valley. Um, at the time, I didn't feel Vietnamese. I felt like I wanted to be something else. So I always told other people that I was mixed, not really understanding the impact of that kind of um, uh, response when somebody asked me what my identity was. And as I grew older, I began to embrace uh, what it means to be Vietnamese and then what it means to be Vietnamese American. Um, and then finally, when you, when I went to Vietnam for the first time, and this was like in the late 1990s, I'm old as fuck, as you know that. Um, I decided <laughs> that I wanted to be Vietnamese. I wanted to be like a national Vietnamese. I didn't want to be seen as Viet Q. Wow. Um, and so, and even that was impossible um, because um, by dint of the fact that we live overseas, of course, we are Vicky. So that was hard for me to accept um, when, and so now that um, I have kids um, who are Vietnamese Americans, US citizens, and um, Ellison's only been to Vietnam once, um, I want them to embrace their identities, um, but also embrace the fact that they have a lot of privileges as a US citizen and not to take that for granted. Um, mostly, I want them to know that um, their parents have uh, very um, distinct refugee memories um, and we come from a very interesting uh, familial histories. And I hope that one day, you know, they'll be really interested in knowing more, talking about their um, Vietnamese identities and their vis uh, Vietnamese histories um, and be able to articulate both in such a way that is uh, welcoming and accepting for themselves and for others. That was a long response. Mm -hmm. But why, can I go back to why did you tell people that you were mixed? Where do you think that came from? Yeah. Well, so if you think about it, you know, when we came and this was 75, um, we were unwanted, we were, minder, we were reminders of an ugly war. Um, There's so much racism against Asians and Vietnamese um, in particular, I think I always called a gook or a chink early on. And I had no idea what that meant. So I would just say you too, you know, not understanding what these slurs meant. Um, so 
but I, I had an idea that to be Vietnamese was, was not a good thing, not something that was positive. So um, even though I understood I looked Vietnamese and um, we were Vietnamese, and I remember knowing that I was Vietnamese because my father has, you know, the um, three-striped flag, uh, South Vietnamese flag in our closet. And I would ask him about it. And it was such a beautiful, beautifully wrapped um, piece of material. Um, and he said that we were Vietnamese and that we came from this war. Um, and then, but that was it. So on the one hand, I knew I was Vietnamese, but on the other hand, I also um, knew that um, it wasn't acceptable to be Vietnamese. Um, but so when my you know, consciousness, my political consciousness really came to be was when I realized that in our working class neighborhood in San Jose, there were other Southeast Asian refugees just like me. And we actually dominated both um, the junior high and the high schools that I went to. So it was so much easier to say that I was Vietnamese and be proud of it. And so that if somebody called us nips, which we, you know, were often called or gooks, um, it would be uh, an insult to something that we would, you know, fight against, literally, you know, get into fights. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a very meaningful time to be able to see myself as uh, Vietnamese and to claim that um, and be among other Vietnamese refugees who uh, enjoyed New Wave and who enjoyed fashioning for ourselves a different identity that was separate from other, let's just say East Asian Americans or um, other even Cambodian Americans or Laotian refugees because we felt like we were different. When you were growing up in San Jose, uh, were you academically like on that track uh, to become somebody in academia or did you want to be in business or you want to go into the arts? What was it like growing up in San Jose at the time? It was very interesting. Um, so it was pre Silicon Valley in that formation, but by the time I got to high school, um, Silicon Valley was the way in which many refugees and immigrants actually were able to make money um, and um, afford themselves, you know, a living wage. And my family was a part of that immigrant labor that really powered the Silicon Valley high tech industry at the time. So um, seeing my uh, family members, because we all lived in one house, maybe about six or seven of us, um, seeing everybody work so hard, um, if not in Silicon Valley, then at Carl's Jr.'s and Pizza Hut um, and, and trying to make a living uh, for us, uh, for ourselves. Um, I, I'm the youngest of the family and very much the black sheep. So I wanted to be something different and fashioned myself as a writer. So yes, I wanted to be in the arts um, and in college, I read um, Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. Um, and I read the little bio about Toni Morrison, um, and, which said that she was both a writer and, an, uh, and a professor or an academic. And I thought that was what I wanted to be. So Toni Morrison is still um, my inspiration for, um, for writing powerful literature and then also just being such a formidable uh, cultural influence um, for people and for myself especially. So yeah, I um, wanted to go away from the, that kind of industry, high-tech industry. My sister's a lawyer and a judge um, and I wanted to yeah do something different. And when you pursued this different path, uh, did your family sort of give you the blessing because you're the black sheep and they were like, oh, youngest one, you can do whatever you want? Or did you kind of have to struggle and, and fight back? 
No, no fighting back because <laughs> by the time that my father got to me, um, everybody else wore him down. And so um, we have he, nine, you know, siblings in the family. So, um, but he was also very supportive, my father, because he felt like educators, especially as, as you know, in Vietnam are highly valued um, and respected. Mm. So he um, encouraged me um, to be, you know, an academic, not exactly a writer, but an academic. Did you meet your future husband in San Jose? No, we, and it's a really um, bad literary cliche, but we met on a stormy and dark night. <laughs> it was in Oakland and it was a poetry reading, which um, he and um, the group, the literary group that he is a part of with Isabel and Bic Nguyen from Vietnam and other people, it was called Mok Ba Mau, right? Ink and Blood. So as an aspiring writer, I went to these uh, gatherings that they would organize and read my poetry. So that night it was at, and I'm going to, you know, refer to other people that you know too, but, you know, Anlong the actor. Mm -hmm. it was um, at his place um, in Oakland, and it was dark and stormy, and I read my poetry, and then Viet came up, and um, under the pretense of asking for my contact information, um, he asked for my phone number. Um, but so that's how we met initially. Wow, and wow, such is, yeah, I don't know if a lot of people know that story, but that's very cool. That <laughs> the, the the night at um, Muk and Mao, uh, Ink and Blood, there's a lot of people, I mean, An Long, I had no idea An Long was even, you know, An Long is a big, uh, is an actor, is a longtime actor uh, here in LA. And uh, what was he doing up there? And what was, you know? <laughs> uh, at the time, he was an artist and Muk Mao was not just about writers, but also mm -hmm. artists. And um, if anybody follows Divan, the Diasporic Vietnamese Artist Network, um, Divan was based on that kind of um, formation. So it grew or sprouted from that early uh, Ink and Blood uh, group? Right. right. That's very beautiful. Now, before we get into your work, um, I, I want to hear why... Um, what, why you think the subjects of Asian American cinema and literature is so important on a broader society scale for the U.S.? Why is these subjects important that we talk about and that we study? Right. That's um, the point of dissertations, right? But I'm going to try to be as succinct as possible. Um, yeah, Asian American literature um, has a long lineage of uh, being very vocal, um, politically activist, and uh, resistant. Um, and I think it's important for um, the U.S. or U.S. national cultures to know that Asian Americans have been in the U.S. for a very long time. They are not just laborers and, you know, um, uh, model minorities or um, machinic, but they are cultural producers. Um, major writers have come uh, out, not come out, but have, have identified as Asian American authors and writers um, and publishers. So it's important to see that there is this long lineage of um, just beautiful, uh, moving literature that deals with um, Asian American identities, Asian American histories, and really thinks through the notions of, you know, how, um, how Asians, how Asian histories have really informed the ways in which Asian Americans see themselves here in the U.S. and then, you know, go back and forth between their um, different countries of origin, if, you know, as transnational Asian Americans. 
Um, and those kinds of facets of this particular ethnic literature um, have always drawn me to, to the study of Asian American literature. And so to my students and to, you know, the mainstream readership at large, I say that Asian American literature is rich and diverse and great. And it is um, definitely a part of the American literary canon. Um, in terms of Asian American cinema, um, I think it's on an upswing. There's a lot more demand for Asian American representations, both on the screen and behind the camera. And in terms of just Asian American creatives and all different kinds of genres, um, I think there is uh, more of a recognition that we need this kind of diversity um, in the film industry. So in recognizing that, I also add that uh, Asian American independent filmmakers and writers and creatives have been at work and in production for a very long time. So it's not as if finally Asian Americans are making media. It's just um, more topical and relevant during this time period, but there is a long lineage of um, great Asian American filmmaking and media making that I think students and again, a mainstream audience should uh, know and recognize. You know, there is a, um, an organization called Visual Communications mm -hmm. that uh, exists here in LA and they focus predominantly on um, Asian American cinema. They've been around for how many years? I think it's like 70 years or seven decades. Is, is, that, is that right? It's not like a 20 year or 30 year thing. It's been around for a long time, right? Yeah, I don't know exactly how long, but yeah, there are institutions and an infrastructure in place to um, support Asian American media works, but it's still not enough, you know, because we don't have um, a lot of enough funding, um, Asian American um, culture or cultural productions are not seen as uh, valuable um, job makers, I guess, because as you know, and the stereotype goes, um, Asian American parents want lawyers and doctors and engineers. But I think there's a shift to um, um, seeing us as um, culture makers and cultural thinkers uh, so that there might be a shift and opening to accepting other kinds of, you know, career opportunities for Asian American um, children. Now, in the last few years, we've noticed an, a surge in Asian American uh, IP, uh, intellectual property, uh, book titles like Crazy Rich Asians that finally make it to the big screen. And uh, there's, you can argue that that was a good or a bad thing. But if you drift into further waters of this entertainment business mm -hmm. with Bling Empire or House of Hoes, what is your thoughts on the portrayal, whether it's negative, positive, or, you know, however, you know, there's been on these type of shows and, you know, a disclaimer, had, you know, the whole cast of House of Ho uh, on the show. And um, I, you know, I, I support the House of Ho because it's a, a Vietnamese a reality TV show. And I think that there are some very good moments in the show. But I wonder what a cinema professor at USC would think about that sort of representation for Asian Americans and then for Vietnamese in particular? Right. That's a great question. Um, but I'm probably the last person you should ask about bad films or bad TV because I enjoy bad TV. And reality TV shows I know are um, uh, can be called trashy and um, bad taste. But if you think about it, and as a scholar of and teacher of horror films or um, uh, genre films um, that are not, you know, seen in um, good taste, 
I think we should see these kinds of representations within a spectrum. And, um, and I don't, and I'm not a believer necessarily in thinking that these are good or bad representations, but they are certainly one kind of representation, but we always need more. And to, to even out the score, right, to fill that spectrum up with as many representations, as many subjects as um, white Americans, mostly white males have had, like in media, you can, you know, so many shades of whiteness yeah. in um, U.S. film and media that um, that's what you see all the time and you're bombarded with that. So if there is a House of Ho, which I've only seen one episode of, or Bling Empire, I say, um, let's add to this you Love know, archive because it just means that we don't have enough. I love that answer. And, you know, we, we have an Instagram page for the Vietnamese podcast. And sometimes the comments are like, you or ouch, or, you know, uh, SMH, shake my head. There's all of these negative comments. And I sometimes I just want to fire back like what you're saying. We need more of this. We need more representation, period. It isn't, we shouldn't be limited to, you know, just the, mo the beautiful and, and the wonderful things. But all right. of the, all sides of this is beautiful. Right. And um, so earlier I talked about how things are a social construction, like during our phone conversation. So taste is a social construction in that it is, um, it's not uh, an instinctive thing that we just know with, with, uh, what we can call high art and low art. You know, there are, um, distinctions that as a society are mainly made up of, again, mostly privileged white um, men who have argued that, let's just say, high art constitutes um, ballet and that we, and classical music and classical films like Citizen Kane, and that anything outside of that canon is bad. Um, but the, but the landscape in terms of tastes and critics and reviews have changed so much because the, so the media landscape has changed. So everybody has an opinion. Um, and so that's a good thing about social media, especially that, you know, it's democratizing the way in which we uh, evaluate art. Um, but at the same time, we have to also uh, recognize that those uh, distinctions of what makes good and bad art are um, um, social constructions that have been made in very um, specific historical moments. This is all academic <laughs> talk for saying um, we should um, jettison these notions of um, what is um, what are art objects that are in bad taste because those kinds of things change gener generationally and it depends on you know who's in the conversation with you now 20 years ago when i was an undergrad undergrad at usc uh i went in knowing that usc is a renowned film school it's an institution it's been the, it's the oldest in the country and it comes with a certain set of uh, cultural kind of parameters, right? As it relates to film and media. As a professor there today in the cinema department, do you find yourself having to challenge the administration, the app establishment, the students, you know, redrawing lines of representation? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I never really get um, asked this, um, but... And I respond um, um, to more general questions about being a professor by still talking about the problems of the institution. Um, so USC has that reputation of, you know, being one of the oldest film schools. And, um, and but I'm ambivalent about that because uh, there's, a, there's some gatekeeping um, as a result of that kind of reputation. And that reputation falls hard on the students 
who feel like, especially uh, underprivileged and uh, marginalized students. Um, so I talked to a lot of Vietnamese American students who feel like um, they have refugee parents or immigrant parents and they made it to USC. And in order to survive and thrive, they have to do um, everything everywhere all at once, right? But it takes a toll on them mentally. And um, there, then there's very little, sometimes very little support at home or very little community support for what they do. So they find themselves really struggling mentally, financially, um, and emotionally uh, in terms of academic work, yes. And I see some students just drop out. So having gone to USC, the standards have been um, raised um, progressively in order to um, maintain that reputation of a very, you know, high quality education, um, top university, um, uh, what is it, credentials, all of that, so that USC can be um, highly ranked. So the expectations are high. Um, and students who come in then also set very high expectations of themselves, which is a good thing. Um, but sometimes in not meeting those expectations, they feel like they failed. And um, the, US, uh, the university also fails them in order to help support them. Some, sometimes financially, I had a student who went on a hunger strike because USC um, made them both housing and food insecure. So these are like real uh, issues and hardships that students are dealing with uh, that USC cannot uh, meet or does not want to, to meet. So for me, coming from a UC education, private, uh, I'm sorry, public education system, that's really disappointing and in my mind, you know, amoral. So I have a very ambivalent um, relationship to USC. On the one hand, I'm really proud of the students who come through my classes and who make it and who are successful. Um, on the other hand, I see the university in general as um, punishing or more punitive than I would like. Wow, this is going to take us down a rabbit hole because I think about the quality of education of a school like USC versus a Cal State LA. Mm -hmm. And having gone to both now, I feel like there's very different education, a level of education, it's very different. So what's the merit of even going to Cal State LA anymore if I know that the quality is different and the competitive edge of not only just the branding of the football program, of all of the money that the donors have put into USC, it, it's just, it feels defeating to go to anything less than that, that school. And then from that point, I feel like society is out of whack because of the amount of resources that's going into one part of the education system versus a public education system. Mm -hmm. How do we sort of mitigate the, the, the problems that arise out of this difference within, you know, even my family, you know, mm -hmm. two kids go to here, this school and the other cousins don't, or they go to a different tier. It creates all kinds of, you know, we, we're fragmented as a society because of these natural occurrences of, of resources. What's your thought on that? Yeah. So are they natural or are they fairly mm. unnatural because they've been engineered by um, our government leaders, um, by corporate um, giant corporations, um, by sometimes the citizens who have um, downgraded um, an education for their own, for students. Um, and so if there is an understanding of a different 
of these differing levels of education. Um, partly it is, um, again, the construction. So you mentioned USC and the way that it um, participates in uh, getting donors money, um, participating recently in like the Big Ten. Is it, is it I, don't, Ten? I don't follow football. Me neither. But um, also um, getting um, donors and big money um, and big corporations to invest or have a, a board of trustees, which is very separate from the faculty. So usually when, when people think of higher education, they think the faculty run the schools and that it's uh, these liberal bastions of um, professors like myself who talk about, you know, anti-racism or anti-blackness um, and all these like leftist ideologies, possibly communist ideologies that um, run the school. It's absolutely not the case at USC or at other universities. Um, the board of trustees are mostly corporate people. Um, one of them, Rick Caruso, is running for mayor in LA, um, and he and he's just, you know, bought himself, I think, a position on the board. Um, and other like big names like Steven Spielberg. So what that does is that they don't really care enough to ask about a faculty opinion or a faculty. Um, they don't ask for our um, perspective at all in running the university or, or not much. So what that means is that it's, a, it's, it's corporate like, it's corporatist, it's run like a corporation where students have now become consumers and that um, they, the humanist education, for example, English is devalued because it's not considered valuable uh, in the uh, free marketplace. Um, the kinds of departments that I'm in, like feminist studies or ethnic studies, uh, not um, are marginalized and constantly have to run on empty in terms of funding. They are marginalized because um, both the board and other um, higher ups in the administration, I don't think really value the kind of training that we impart to students about you know, critical thinking. And I think the, the public at large um, usually I think that these um, majors called women's studies, right, is a waste of time. Um, and so there is a devaluation of certain kinds of um, um, educational training. So that's unfortunate, but that was in the works for a while because on the one hand, um, public education or education is still a means to climb up the social economic ladder in the US and to achieve the American dream, et cetera. But at the same time, um, there was less uh, money from the state in order to fund um, public educations and universities in general. So with that shift, it was beholden on um, the citizens or uh, the public to put in money into education or the university, which means they have a stake in saying, well, this education is, um, you know, worth it or not, uh, too expensive. Uh, why should we pay for um, a, a major like women's studies? And so with that shift came um, more um, a devaluing, I think, of a humanities type education. Um, less funding from the state meant that the university had to get more funds from corporations in order to beef up its, um, its you know, economic infrastructure, um, which means that the university had to hire more administrators. I know this is kind of a long spiel, but um, the university had to hire more administrators to manage the money, to manage marketing, promotions, everything that you would need to run a corporation, right? So it's not 
any more um, about a public good, you know, um, being in the system, in the education system, but it's more like producing a product to students and to the trust, the board, the trustee board, or board of trustees, and to the public about um, how valuable uh, or not your uh, training might be um, of other students. So it's, I think, really devolved into a mess of, um, uh, of a structure where we don't have um, enough faculty governance in the university space. And um, at the same time, um, education is not as uh, valued as it used to be. That's uh, some, pers but this is perspective that we, as former students or lay people, we don't get to hear often. And it reminds me of the, uh, I think it's on Netflix, the, the show with um, Sandra uh, O, oh, uh, The Chair. Yeah. Um, there's just so much going on in the back end between the the faculty and, and the board of trustees that it's a constant battle. It's a constant uh, um, fight. And, you know, when I think about what you do and what materials you teach, mm -hmm. you know, I think about the process of like selecting the content that you show. And so I wanted to segue into that. Um, what is your process for selecting the films and the books and, and the content that you show in class as it relates and pertains to all of this other stuff that's happening in the background? Yeah, no, that's a great question because I, I do put in a lot of thought into my syllabus or class structure as I, I think uh, many educators do. Uh, but I'm particularly sensitive to um, not referring to the classic canons of um, U.S. film, U.S. Hollywood uh, films. And I tend to teach classes on, you know, or I have taught classes on international cinema, um, a class on the Vietnam War in film, um, and classes on Asian American women's literature and film. So it's very particular um, um, and it highlights those kinds of topics or subjects that are not talked about enough, right? So um, I, there's not many instances where I'm teaching a class where I don't talk about race or feminism or um, queer theory or uh, you know, um, anything or uh, not, n there's never a topic where I'm not uh, critiquing white supremacy, nationalism or xenophobia. So all those hot topics that are in, uh, in our current political discourse and all those polarizing terms, I bring into the classroom intentionally, um, but hoping not to trigger anyone, um, to have conversations, really what I think are authentic conversations about who we are as a, as a society, even though I'm teaching about films, right? Um, and what it means for these students to be um, global citizens, um, future uh, and current global citizens who will you know, shape and reshape our values as a society. In your classes, do you ever have students diametrically oppose you and just challenge you uh, for the positions that you have? Yeah, I've been teaching for a long time. So there's always one. And uh, sad to say, but they're, they're inevitably men. Um, and I think there is um, a power dynamic that they find maybe unnerving because I often um, put... Um, white privilege on blast, white male privilege on blast, and maybe that kind of um, conversation, you know, unnerves. Triggering for them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I don't really care uh, enough, I guess, to respond to those kinds of challenges today. I mean, um, maybe as a younger um, teacher, 
or professor, I would be very sensitive to that. Um, but if it happens or, and when it does, um, I will try to talk it over with the student, but also talk about it in class to address uh, their concerns, but also to shut it down. Can we talk about some of the films you've chosen in the classes? A few titles. I'm, I'm interested in um, what it is that you show. Yeah. Okay. So right now I'm teaching a class on Asian horror. And um, so I highlight films that deal with horror films, um, but try to um, bring into the classroom films that students might not have readily seen already. So what's very current or what used to be uh, very current are Japanese uh, horror films, J-horror or Korean horror films or K-horror. So because I work so specifically on Vietnamese cinema and Southeast Asian cinema, um, and there are not enough books about this kind of cinema or not enough classes on these cinemas, I, I bring these kinds of film works in so that students understand that Asia is not just comprised of East Asian countries and that there are um, other um, countries that are making uh, really great films, um, but the power dynamics are yeah, are such a way that, you know, we only have access to the greatest hits from uh, mostly Japan, Korea, South Korea, and mainland China, and Hong Kong. Um, so uh, in this horror film class, I'm teaching um, The Eye by the Pong Brothers. Um, so they're from Hong Kong, but they've shot it entirely in Thailand. Um, Shutter, um, done by a Thai filmmaker, um, a Singaporean film that deals with Filipina Filipina um, laborers in Singapore, um, by Calvin Tong, and Nong Nok, by uh, Nonzi Nimabuter, as well as um, Uncle Boomi, um, and so I and I was this close to um, showing the housemaid by Derek Wing. And um, I wanted to do that, but couldn't like manage to bring that in. But I have taught uh, like a Vietnamese horror film. I think it's called Mui um, before and students liked it. Um, so yeah, I'm always trying to um, put in to the, the film courses, um, films that are not uh, readily accessible, are not talked about enough, and are, um, you know, are unfamiliar um, to students. Uh, so that's my tactic in, in intentionally bringing together a film list or filmography that resonates with me and uh, that I think would open um, students' horizons to uh, other kinds of filmmaking. Aside from the horror genre that you teach, what are some Vietnamese titles that you would encourage your own children to watch? Okay, so I taught a class on Vietnamese cinema. And I run the gamut between um, those films that have been made um, by the state, uh, most specifically um, communist works that were um, done during the classical um, period of Vietnamese filmmaking. Um, those are hard to access because some of them are not subtitled. So I have to go with whatever's been um, produced or re-digitized and uh, subtitled for uh, English language audiences. Uh, when I first taught the, the work, this Vietnamese film class, this was about 10 years ago, I couldn't find many films like that. So I would have to bring in like uh, black marketed work films that I bought, you know, at the Phuc Lộc Tho or in, you know, Vietnam. And I would show the films, but they were bad quality <laughs> and not always bad. Um, they were also not well done, but I still wanted to see, have students see what Vietnam 
can produce mm. rather than, you know, just talk about Vietnam as a war. So it was important that I talk about Vietnamese filmmaking uh, and its historical um, um its historical importance. So I would um, teach Dang Nhat Minh's uh, When the 10th Month Comes or The Woman on the Perfume River, and then also use um, Viet, um, gosh, I'm blanking out on the names. I'm so sorry, this is not my thing um, to blank out on um, filmmakers' names, but um, the work, oh, I know, would be Traveling Circus by Vietnamese film, uh, a woman filmmaker by the name of uh, Viet Lin. And um, let me see, moving towards um, transnational films, um, like, of course, um, like, ugh. Um, Hams, Hams. Journey from the Fall. Journey from the Fall for sure, but, um, but it, then also is like... Is it Hams? Or are you trying to remember Hams films or somebody else's film? No, I should know this, but but I also bring into play like... Um, um, uh, um, the House Made by Derek Nguyen, Bi Deng Sa by Phan Deng Zi. So a lot of works that speak to contemporary Vietnamese life. Also, of course, you know, uh, one of our um, shared friends um, who's passed, Stefan Gogger's Owl and the Sparrow. So um, I wanted to use these kinds of films to show uh, what... Vietnamese American filmmakers have done, as well as Vietnamese filmmakers um, have um, sought to portray of contemporary Vietnamese life. And it's important for me to talk about transnational Vietnamese cinema as transnational because of the ways in which, as you know, a lot of Vietnamese American creatives have gone back to Vietnam, especially after, you know, Doi Mai and, the 1994 uh, lifting of the trade embargo, because of these kinds of legislative moves, um, uh, many Vietnamese diasporans have come back in order to work and produce uh, film and media. So that kind of movement um, between countries and between cultures is fascinating for me and is a core part of um, the book on Vietnamese cinemas that I'm working on right now. Fascinating indeed. Uh, one side note is um, Ham Tran was uh, a housemate of yours. Um, at, at you know that's sort of like a, a little footnote in film Vietnamese film history. Uh, at one point, yeah, it was like Stefan Gager, myself, Ham Tran coming over to eat lunch and or hang out at your house uh, with Viet. Um, yeah. Those were. You know, I mean, when you go through it at the time, you don't really think much of it until somebody dies. You know, it's not a funny thing, but it is a funny thing because it's Stefan. Stefan's a funny was a funny guy, but you don't at the time you don't think about how special those moments are because you're busy enjoying how funny he is, and and yeah. then it all goes by and it becomes like this really big footnote in Vietnamese American film history that yeah. you know Ham Tran was living with. Lan Zung and Viet Thanh Nguyen, you know, it's beautiful, you know, I was so, I was so glad to be a part okay. of that in my little way, you know, and yeah. it's an amazing time. Yeah. So part of the group was also Jenny Zhang Lea to yes. give shout outs to her and the amazing work that she does um, as producer and, you know, creative herself. Um, part of the discussion uh, or conversation included Issa Lei because I worked with uh, via VIF so so much and so you know um, exclusively for a long part of that time uh, in my life and um, I think Vietnamese cinema as a whole has grown so much that it's really exciting to be a part of the Vietnamese film industry and being um, and now being a witness to all these films that are being made by uh, Vietnamese filmmakers, but also Vietnamese diasporic um, 
filmmakers and um, and younger uh, filmmakers. I mean, the kinds of things that they're doing. Like I saw Carol Wins. I was and, just going to say Carol Wins. <laughs> right. Yeah. Cry at, uh, no crying at the dinner table mm -hmm. kind of blew and, me away. So, yeah, it's an exciting time to be a part of this landscape. And, and today, uh, which is, uh, she just released uh, or got selected for um, Nanitic, her new short. Um, oh. I think it's for Toronto. Yeah. So, you know, big shout out to Carol. She's uh, I, like a few episodes back. She was on, on the podcast and what a bright uh, young person, you know, young woman. She's so bright. But to book and to, to add the sort of like this bookends with Issa and Jenny, um, you know, Issa is, you know, with, without Issa, without Issa Lay, I think a lot of this would have been kind of hard to kind of coagulate, if that's the right word. I mean, you know, she really kind of set the, 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 the environment for all of us to get together and, and have a place to go annually and check in with each other and really be there to support. And without her, you know, you wouldn't have your, your, your hams and your Jennies uh, getting together to, 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 to meet up and, and then Stefan and me and Tim Bowie, Tony Bowie, that, that, that whole world. Um, and then you have your young ones, younger ones like Bao Win. He's actually one of the young newer, newer members 14 years ago or 13 years ago, but one of the newer, newer members of, of the film, of Vietnamese American film community. Yeah, it's amazing what uh, Issa has done, but uh, what Vala has done, what Viv has done, and that is to create a community space for even talking about films. You know, when nobody was really talking about films um, among us, and so I'm so appreciative of VIF. And I talk about VIF in my book as a really important community space, you know, before the pandemic, where we met each other, we broke bread with each other, we hookahed together, you know, and it, it created a sense of community and belonging that I hope that the generations that follow will continue to um, create because if you don't have community support, it's hard. It's harder for one to um, just break out into the industry on your own. So um, I hope it continues. Um, and I think it will, um, and, but maybe in a different platform, like yeah. through Zoom or through uh, other digital means. But yes, well, it's very impactful. It's funny yeah. you bring up the, the hookah thing uh, because... <laughs> Funny enough, I'm going to bring this up. Um, your house, your uh, the house that we all met at, your house was right above and walking. To, you walk down the hill uh, above Ali Mama is yeah. a hookah spot that all of us went with Ham and and Anderson and all these wonderful Jenny and continue. We continue to go to that mm -hmm. hookah spot and, uh, you know, brings back, you know, we did that. We did that for Stefan's uh um, commemoration of his death you know we went there and and, and all smoked uh hookah so yeah mm -hmm. there it's like that you bring that up it's um it's very significant these these markers that we have in our in our lives together as a community yeah and that was really fun so segueing because uh, you've just brought up um other things not related to the film industry so i want to bring up um, an exhibition that uh, you curated called troubling borders about women writers and artists and points uh, i'm going to just read the read off my notes here these women uh, writers and artists point to the ruptures caused by colonization war globalization and militarization um how did this come together and um this idea of curating and putting an exhibit together, um, logistics, uh, funding, how, how did you put it all together and why did you do it? Wow. Um, I, and this is a great question because uh, the book's publication is now uh, at the 10 year mark, almost 10 year mark, but um, even you know before the publication, of course, it was a very long undertaking, five years in the making or more, uh, where um, the editors and I 
just came up with our own funding to to do this uh, magnificent book. The, and the reason why it was so costly is because we wanted very specifically for the art to be in color and to be, I mean, publicate, publishing is so expensive these days in, in general. But we uh, fundraised on our own uh, about $20,000 to produce this book, um, which includes, I don't know, 73 different artists and uh, activists, poets and writers. Um, and it was a collaborative event. Uh, uh, what is it? It was a collaborative formation where the editors and I wanted to finally, I think, uh, speak about our Southeast Asian history. Okay. Okay, so uh, we wanted to showcase and highlight the fact that um, as uh, women, uh, and especially as Southeast Asian women, uh, we are more than, you know, dragon ladies or prostitutes in uh, Vietnam War films or um, immigrant laborers, but we are, we produce, you know, vital and vibrant poetry and art. So that was the impetus for the book and the impetus for um, fundraising um, and we really worked our asses off to get the book in publication. I'm so proud of this effort because some of the um, folks who are featured in the book are just like um, um, celebrity writers, celebrity artists and books, uh, you know, uh, renowned um, um, artists now. And to be able to say that they were in our books, um, book is just so uh, important for us. That's wonderful. Um, when, when you are doing these things and um, you're looking for support and you're looking for um, finance and, you know, how does this work? Uh, you know, is it an easy thing? Is it easy to go out to the community and, you know, I, I wonder about that because it's so difficult to get people, you know, on the film level, on any art level, especially Asians, to really chip in and be a part of um, building culture. Right. Um, no, the process was pretty uh, arduous because um, we are all Vietnamese American women editors. And so we had our um, ready access to certain Vietnamese American artist networks. Um, but at the same time, because we wanted to be more inclusive um, and draw in other kinds of um, other um, diasporas, diasporic um, women artists, we had to just cold call to see if um, people were interested in submitting. Mm. Um, I had to get in contact with all these different networks and submit a call um, for artwork and writing. Um, it so it was a long process of trying to get these networks together because they're not co consolidated. This was before social media necessarily and before um, um, having these uh, networks in place, we had to form them ourselves. So uh, that was a process. Funding was hard because we don't have the infrastructure to you know, readily support uh, this kind of project. Um, Southeast Asian Americans as a population um, are not seen you know, or heard yeah. enough. So um, when we think about artists, it certainly changed now. Um, because Vietnamese American writers are so popular, but at the time, you know, we didn't have enough support or even recognition um, that we were uh, a body of artists who wanted to get our voices and our artwork um, known and publicized. So no funding whatsoever from our departments um, or from other organizations. And so that's why we had to fundraise on our own. This idea of expression and um, having voices heard and amplified, 
I think of uh, the work that you do uh, in and out of the academic space, and I want to know what your thoughts are on academic freedom uh, in Vietnam. Uh, do you know much about it? Are you kind of plugged into the scene there? Yeah, well, because uh, again, before the pandemic, I did a lot of research. I was in the archives, I was in the libraries um, for in both Saigon and Hanoi. Uh, for a long time. And so that's uh, um, where a lot of um, my research comes from. Um, but I also have family there um, and I still have family there. All this is to say that, yes, I'm very much in tune with the political life of uh, the Vietnamese. And I am very critical of the Vietnamese state in general um, because of the ways in which uh, they have used uh, these kind of uh, tactics of surveillance and monitoring um, of citizens to make sure that they um, can repress, you know, freedom of speech. Um, so I'm uh, very attuned to that, if that's the question. And I'm very critical of those kinds of state um, maneuvers um, and very much in support of artists, of course, um, and, and uh, anti-censorship, anti-banning of any kind, even here in the U.S. or especially here in the U.S. because for, um, we're supposedly known as a country of free speech. But more specific to Vietnam, um, yeah, I believe that there needs to be uh, more criticism of uh, Vietnamese state repression of speech, of uh, cinematic content, and um, and I'm uh, supportive wholeheartedly of artists and activists who make these uh, um, claims against the state, but then um, who are arrested for that and um, jailed indefinitely. So I am very much in support, and this um, goes to, um, I think a question that we'll talk about later um, about Vietnamese American politics, but I'm in support of a strain of Vietnamese American politics where they are critical of the Vietnamese state. I, um, I think the, that dissension within the diaspora is needed and um, needed, needed, needs to be amplified. Um, absolutely. So there are some strains of Vietnamese American political discourse that I'm in support of. What was your feelings on the January 6th insurrection or display of our flag, display of our parents' flag, I, you know, I, however okay. we want to see it, but it's the old flag and there's a lot of emotions that come from what happened uh, on the dis on that day, the display of that flag. Um, well, so I have controversial views. Um, and so that's just a heads up to say that I was absolutely disgusted um, by seeing the flag there. I still get upset because the, the images of the Vietnamese flag within that riot and insurrection, uh, fatal insurrection um, is, you can still see images of the flag in, um, in uh, when there's a publication about what happened on January 6th. So my first response is um, disgust that uh, there would be a segment or, or a large population, let's be honest, um, in the Vietnamese American communities where they feel that Trump is heroic, ultra masculine, um, and is um, anti-Chinese um, and uh, on the side of right and might. Um, that kind of Trumpist ideology among the community, among certain community members, and I've seen the videos online, I've seen the support online, um, 
completely dispirits me um, as an activist. And so um, I've been, I was a part of conversations among a younger generation of activists who want to disable that kind of uh, conversation or at least uh, intervene in that conversation in order to break it down and um, um, identify what's misinformation or disinformation in Vietnamese language media. I support those efforts wholeheartedly, but I also think that there is, uh, has been a, a trend because of the way in which South Vietnam was constructed as a government or as a republic early on that relied on US um, funding um, to fund the war against uh, the North communist Vietnamese side um, and used and really learned US propaganda in order to um, make its own propaganda about how um, democracy was needed. And it, it was at the time because the communists were not were also repressive in their own right, but how the South Vietnamese needed a US style kind of democracy um, in order to um, put together the South Vietnamese Republic. And in so doing really uh, imbibed a lot of the, the ideology about, again, what's right is might and what's might is right, which, um, speaks to some of the Trumpist uh, values, I think, of some anti-communist conservative Vietnamese Americans who wholeheartedly are um, buying into the idea that uh, we have to be anti-Chinese and so therefore, um, uh, you know, anti um, um anti-Chinese and anti-Vietnamese um, state um, in order to, uh, and be, and, you know, buy into the idea that the U.S. in its nationalism and white supremacist values, I mean, we still see Trumpist ideology today, um, you know, undergirding a lot of our political discourse, um, that that is right that that it's a moral and um, maybe religious, um, religiously driven um, right that we as Vietnamese Americans who have come to uh, the US and as refugees should be on the side of, uh, on, the, on being on the side of, you know, um, xenophobia and white supremacy and nationalism, so much so that there is anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric in what I see in a lot of Vietnamese American political discourse or Amer Vietnamese American conversations, or what I see is anti-Blackness um, in, in, in making these kinds of claims about being on the side of what's right for um, America and um, by extension, Vietnamese Americans. Um, so yeah, I see all of that as deeply problematic and deeply um, um, blinded by a certain ideology that I uh, cannot or do not um, tolerate. So to some of these people in the community, I'm tired of trying to have conversations with these folks where, and they are in my family, right? So it's not as if they're um, yeah. not intimate relationships, um, but I'm tired of trying to change hearts and minds because if you're not on the side of progressivism, um, which means to me um, being for you know, trans rights, being for refugee rights, um, and um, taking a side against racism and anti-Blackness, then I don't want to be in conversation with you. These things are so related to common sense to me. Like, how could you be against the things that you just talked about? Anti-trans, anti... -trans, anti
being homophobic, how it's just so common sense to me, especially when you pair it with Christian values, Catholic values that God is love, Jesus is love. And I've had so much conversation, but I wonder what you think of this, because in my mind, I just equate it to misinformation. People who are just not able to listen to, I don't know, the written word, the way it should be in, in its truth, because you do talk to these Vietnamese people and it, and it is anti-gay uh, uh, rights. It's anti, it's anti-trans and it's, and it's just common sense to me. How is this even related to God being love and how does it align with Christian values? It cannot, it's just common sense to think about it. No, but my question to you is, is that more of a function of them not understanding or do you think they do understand and they just, hold on to the values that are not right mm -hmm. i think that's a that's a great question um and i i also want to make the qualification that the vietnamese american community is not a monolith right so if if i talk about religion right. um it's not only uh, christianity or catholicism although my family's uh, a devout catholic family um but um and they're what is it? And it's a spectrum of beliefs right. that are that lean towards, you know, being both conservative and uh, but also liberal on some viewpoints. So but it's those hardcore Trumpists that I think uh, I have no um, alliance, like I don't have a rapport with in any way. And um it's those folks that um, I don't want to talk to. Um, and, but I also think that part of the problem is Vietnamese language media that picks up on misinformation and disinformation in US media or in other kinds of media. Um, even, you know, of course, Vietnamese media in Vietnam is propagandistic too. So, that it's not a problem of just US um, media right now. Um, but so what to do about the distribution and dissemination of misinformation, that's a huge problem to tackle. Um, and it's right now that media scholars that are trying to think through. And so I don't have a solution, but I think that is a major problem for um, some members of the Vietnamese American community who are not uh, under not, not understanding, but who are hearing and reading um, um, information or receiving information that is, um, is it maybe not translated well, which um, the Pivot Network, as you know, because you've spoken to some members of Pivot. Um, try to have tried to address you know th so it does deal with just translation work and language work but in general um, misinformation in media is huge is a huge problem that um, um, relates to all kinds of classes uh, yeah um, in US society and Vietnamese society. So it's not a matter of um, um, misinformation uh, or misinformed, a uh, misinformed public as it relates to education, like not understanding or not um, being educated enough to understand. It's actually, you know, multi level, multi class issue. Um, and it also depends on different access to different kinds of media. Is it through social media that people are getting misinformed or is it through radio or is it through newsprint? And if, if that's the case, and if it's all of these kinds of platforms, how do we as Vietnamese American activists, you know, tackle each one in their particularity? Yeah, and there are some wonderful activists out there, um, young people like, Cookie Zung, she's doing uh, the interpreter. She's also a USC alumni. 
Viet Fact Check coming out of Pivot, all these wonderful organizations that are tackling. But all that being said, mm -hmm. I don't want to cut off my ties with these people because it's just, these are people in my family. These are people in, that I have to meet in society. And I, it pains me to know that I need to walk away, but I, I just can't do it because I just feel like if we walk away and we don't have conversations, the polarity, the, 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 the divide just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And I already have lost many in my family um, and I can't get back to them. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't turn back time and I can't take back these arguments that we had uh, about Trump and about you know, progressive issues. We're done for forever i think we will never go back to that and i think there's always been a sort of i don't know if i should say this but there's been a jealousy uh mm -hmm. of of sorts you know maybe i don't know may, that maybe i'm just thinking out of my ass here but there's a resentment is better is a better word there's a resentment when my brother and i come to the table more armed with details facts education all the things that matter in an argument and that is the problem. It feels very condescending mm. to that side of the family. And we've lost them. It'll never go back. It'll never turn back. And so that experience has really forced me to just shut my mouth and love my uncles and love my cousins and just over time pray that we can sit back down and talk about random things that are not politically driven but what's your thought on that? I, I, you know, I, I can't walk away from more family and lose more family and friends because of misinformation problems and, you know, just stupid shit. Uh, it really is just stupid shit that we, um, and, I, and I don't mean the big political things. I'm just little things that we talk about, not politically related. There's this resentment that, you know, Tom and I are educated or we've done certain things in our lives that are just a little bit above and beyond the family. And, and so it really irks me to think that we've left family behind and, and loved ones behind. And I feel like this is not just happening to Tom and I, it's happening to a lot of people. Yep. Yeah. So I have a lot of second generation uh, Vietnamese Americans who come and ask, um, how do they reconcile these differences, these huge differences in political uh, thought in the family? Um, and they, they do want to do the uh, re work of talking and repairing um, and not be estranged from their family members. I totally get that. Um, my way is, has, has been uh, shaped by my particular experiences as a feminist, as, um, um, as the, the, the youngest in the family, let's just say, who, um, who've had to mediate a lot of these kinds of conflicts. So uh, I say this as um, a 50 year old um, who have, has witnessed a lot of conflicts. And so I have chosen my battles. And in so doing, I have chosen to walk away and leave uh, these relationships uh, because it, they become toxic, you know, and if, and it, it is deeply political to me because if they're talking and I, and you're talking about stupid shit and um, I've, you know, I agree, it, it can be stupid shit, but if somebody is again talking about um, African-Americans in a way that I don't like, that I find very objectionable. Um, I don't want them to be in my life um, or I will say something about it and then you move on. But um, it's, it's that, uh, I guess, perspective where I've decided which battles to, ch uh, to pick and which battles um, I can just walk away from. And uh, at this point in my life, I'm also okay with leaving family members and estranged and being estranged from them um, because of my values. And so if it comes down to values such as, 
you know, seeing uh, black people as humans, um, it, that's where I draw a line. It's not for everybody, my, uh, my position, and I completely understand if you wanna do the, the work of repairing relationships, but that's not who uh, I am right now. I appreciate that answer, it's honest. And um, there's a lot of navigating for, I think our community because of, I mean, it's a simple thing as this whole anti-black, it's, it's prevalent, it's everywhere. It's, a, it's ingrained in our, our language, it's ingrained in the way we view uh, customers or people we service um, in specific industries. Um, you know, it's, it's just a hot mess. And um, I do hope that one day, as we uh, get into the second, third generation of Vietnamese uh, diaspora around the world, we can improve these sort of outlooks. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I hear the, the argument that, you know, uh, generate, there are these major generational differences and, um, and we should try to um, but it, close the gap between the generations. Yeah. I think that's important, but as you talked about earlier, and I think it's uh, really, it really resonates with me, which is that um, um, there is this kind of class resentment that happens when um, the 1.5 generation or second generation Vietnamese uh, American who has gone to school, um, who has not experienced war in the way in which um, mm. our elders have. Um, those two kinds of um, talking points or uh, about you know, who we are as an educated class or as a class of people, as a population of people who have not experienced war in the same way, that it always comes back in the conversation as a way to weaponize yeah. um, their experiences and to shut down the conversation. Um, so I recognize that as a tactic and the class resentment is there. It's alive and well in a lot of my conversations with my own family. Um, and it's something that um, at some point one has to realize is irresolvable, right? It's, it, it is a fact uh, that we have been educated in the US um, system of education, I teach um, as you know, a professor or I am a professor. So there's a different kind of knowledge that I bring to a conversation. Um, but as I've you know, talked about before in my academic work and in community spaces, I respect the kind of knowledge that they bring to the table, um, experience, um, um, their, you know, spiritual ways of knowing the kinds of um, no ways of knowing between women, for example, all of that I appreciate. So on the other side, I, I would appreciate it if they also understood the kinds of knowledge we bring and respect that. And I'm here, you know, fighting for um, my elders and their knowledge and their experiences to be respected and recognized by the U.S. public. And at the same time, there's a way in which they're condescending to me and not respecting that I am 50 years old. Yeah. I am not a child. And, you know, I am, um, I've been doing this for a long time, which is um, being an academic Lan, thank you so much for being open and sharing so much uh, of your perspective today. Oh, you're welcome. And I just enjoyed um, kind of going down memory lane with you too. That was very fun. Um, and I hope we can go to hookah sometime soon. Yes. And uh, <laughs> thank you again for the Vogue, the 73 uh questions that was just as uh, much fun for me as i'm sure it was for you I, it was a great idea yeah okay so okay I'm thanks Lon. okay thank you for listening to the vietnamese with kenneth win the vietnamese is produced by Brittany tran special thanks to jane win Catherine win tina fam sydney jamie and christo trin please find us on instagram facebook and tiktok at the vietnamese podcast 
You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcasts.